Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We've had a couple of weeks off of live recording, so we're coming to you live on Friday, although it's in the afternoon. And we're going to do a couple follow-ups on conversations that we previously talked about a couple weeks ago. First off, we have a follow-up on quantum encryption or post-quantum encryption. As you remember our last week's episode, we talked about the cryptography and how NIST had selected those four algorithms, three of them based on the crystal, um, the crystal's uh, encryption scheme, the dilithium, the Kyber, and Falcon. And then we had one hash-based algorithm, which was called Sphinx Plus. They also had four additional algorithms that were forwarded to the final for further evaluation that they were still kind of looking at that had not been announced as, hey, these are the ones. And if you didn't see it in the news, one of them called Psyche or Psyche, <laughs> super singular isogeny key encapsulation, is probably now out. It was one of the four additional ones that were forwarded to the finals. And it was actually broken by researchers using traditional mathematics and a single classical uh, PC to recover the encryption keys. And to me, this just kind of shows how much we still don't know, right? We're using quantum algorithms, which use probability. They're not even exact answers. They just give us the highest probability of getting that answer whatever we inputted to be outputted and we're using quantum phenomenons in quantum pcs which we don't really know why they happen we just know that they do happen to replace traditional encryption which is still solid as of today and you know we had mentioned in our previous show that these four schemes that were picked by nist are preliminary that they're probably going to change and my guess is you know at some point one or all of them may be broken at some point. And just like our previous encryption schemes, right? Like DAS and triple DAS, RSA 1024, we keep on doubling the key to 2048, 4096, because each one just becomes more and more secure as computing power increases. So I think this is just going to be that cat and mouse game, essentially, right? Like one encryption scheme is announced today it's being used and then all of a sudden it gets broken by some exploit or whatever and then it's out so i wouldn't commit any of these to code quite yet if you're you know early and looking at that um so that's uh that's an update on the post quantum encryption i just those are my thoughts on that it's a perfect reminder of how early days we truly are in that some of these preliminary algorithms we're discovering are relatively straightforward to break i mean in in terms of processing power with classical computing and traditional mathematics and even though we think of mathematics as a you know kind of a black and white thing like either the answer is right or not you, you talk about in here andy how you know des triple des rsa increasing key complexity and and how it's really been a continuum of encryption over time, it's going to be like that as well. We're not going to ha come out with a perfect, unbreakable quantum encryption algorithm day one, probably. And there's still going to be some <laughs> teething and growing pains with that as well. So early days, which again, is kind of fun. I think a lot of us got into this industry in the first place because of the early days of computing when things were changing so rapidly and so quickly, and it was so much fun to kind of keep up with it. And I think on some level, there's been some disillusionment with technology lately because it's become much more uh, of a slow evolution now where most PCs have more than adequate computing power to do any home activity you want to do. And they will last for years and years and years and years because we don't have some sort of killer application coming out that demands more computing power outside of really like gaming and video rendering pretty much. Um, and even the same thing with smartphones. Smartphones were fun for a while because they were like a new computing frontier where things evolved so rapidly and so quickly. And they were so much fun when 
every new Android phone, every new iPhone was kind of a leap forward year over year. And now, you know, we're doing the same thing where it's like, oh, smartphones are boring now because they're kind of incremental. And that's just the maturity curve of technology does that. And so great reminder, we're in the just the absolute infancy of this this new um, frontier. And it'll be fun to follow and develop because it's something new for us that have you know, kind of gotten spoiled from rapid change and, and now to more of a mature change, um, pace of change. So it's, it's exciting, but yeah, really interesting. And if you stuck around to the end of our show last week, we had just kind of mentioned about how cryptography was on the controlled munition list for the United States government for a very, very long time. And at some point it was changed and one of the few podcasts that I listen to religiously for information security is put on by a guy named Steve Gibson. He's part of the twit network and he has a podcast called security now where they have probably over 700 some episodes. Um, and he's a very smart guy. And he had mentioned on his show last week about this new blog where there's a gentleman who is suing the U S government. And so I just kind of looked up the blog article and was reading through it. And it turns out I learned something. So we're going to just talk about it real quick. The blog article is by a guy um, named Daniel Bernstein, who is a well-known mathematician and cryptographer. And I didn't know this guy's name up until the point that I read this blog article, but he's also on the team that published the paper on stateless post quantum hash based signatures, which is now known as Sphinx, which evolved into Sphinx plus, which is the one of the final algorithms that NIST um, picked up, which is the only one that's not using the crystal based encryption in 1995. He sued the U S government in Bernstein versus the United States, where he was only a student at the time at UC Berkeley. And he wanted to publish a paper and the associated source code and the associated source code under the first amendment. I'm sorry, uh, on his snuffle encryption system. And because encryption was a controlled munition, the U S government wouldn't let him publish that paper. And so the ruling in the case declared that the software was protected speech under the first amendment, which contributed to the regulatory changes, reducing controls on encryption. So, you know, that's where we talked about last week, Adam, you and I, where we were talking about how encryption was like outlawed essentially. And, um, and I had read that somewhere and now, you know, I found out a little bit more about that and it's important because now he's filed another lawsuit against the U S government. That's what this blog post is about related to non-compliance with NIST and the complete disclosure of information to the standardization of crypto algorithms. So Daniel uh, claims that the current standardization of algorithms that are, that are on the list that NIST selected, NIST didn't really disclose the complete information about the discussions. um, And they didn't publish any results of the analysis of the resistance of those proposed algorithms. And that, that basically, you know, Daniel is not necessarily accusing NIST of doing anything, but because there is a precedent that NIST has selected algorithms that actually have had known exploits, one famously, which was co-developed with the NSA, NIST had promised after that incident that they would disclose and be fully transparent on the selection process. And uh, Daniel has seven FOIA or Freedom of Information Act requests open for documents relating to the algorithm and, and the kind of the discussions that went along with it. And there's been no response. And so now he's filed this lawsuit. Um, so I just found that that rabbit hole, you know, we always talk about like kind of going down that rabbit hole and discovering things. This blog article led me down a rabbit hole to learn about this guy who is part of very much modern cryptography today and is solely responsible really for us even having open source encryption to be used um, in our daily lives. So um, really interesting uh, blog article. We'll have a link for it for you guys to read through if you're interested. At the end of last week's show, I think where the discussion went, I may have 
mentioned something about PGP originally being smuggled out of the Soviet Union in the early to mid 1990s. And then I think I also briefly referenced Lotus Notes um, and its popularity was driven in part because of the controlled nature of encryption and kind of a a workaround they found to deliver higher levels of encryption than were actually legally allowed at the time in a manner that was actually um, compliant with the, the regulation at the time. So two good things to go read more if you're a student of computing history, along with um, Mr. Bernstein's work at UC Berkeley and, and with this original um, cryptography paper would be the history of Lotus Notes and the history of PGP, pretty good privacy. Uh, those are both very pivotal to the the kind of changes in encryption's legal status in the United States in the mid to late 1990s, um, which is obviously very fundamental to the raise of, of some major businesses today, including our employer, Microsoft, where um, Microsoft Exchange was able to compete on a more fair footing with Lotus Notes moving forward after after those changes, uh, which which most likely contributed very positively to Microsoft's rise as a business software provider, back office solutions provider. Um, so it's all interesting. Like this all comes back full circle. And this is why I'm such a student of computing history is because kind of understanding where we've been helps us understand where we're going. But this is interesting too. I've been highly critical on this show many times about not supporting organizations that hoard vulnerabilities or hide vulnerabilities or back doors. Like I'm, I'm very critical of, um, and, and oh my gosh, now I'm going to blank on the name, but they, uh, celebrate, uh, who, who helps, um, like law enforcement, unlock iPhones and Android phones and stuff like that. They, they do a lot of research to discover and hoard vulnerabilities so they can unlock phones instead of disclosing those, uh, properly to Apple and Google respectively, they will sit on them to ensure they can continue to gain access to those devices. And again, I, I find a security professional, I, I don't agree with that approach at all. So if this is indeed true, what Mr. Bernstein is, is accusing, uh, NIST of it's, it's disappointing and, and hopefully something comes of this and, uh, the truth will come to light. So this is definitely a story we'll follow and, and probably report back on in the future as, as more details come out. So let's talk about something good that the government is doing. We've talked many times about how the U S government and this administration have made a lot of positive strides to try to push organizations into the right, you know, posture um, with CISA taking a larger role. And um, now, you know, we've talked about how DOJ has actually gone after some folks. Recently, the government uh, posted uh, offering $10 million uh, or up to $10 million for information leading to the identification or location of any persons associated with the Conti ransomware gang. So they're paying big money right now to identify those people and bring them in. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that the Conti ransomware gang is highly or suspected to be highly involved with the Russian government that may have contributed to this, but that's more speculation on my part. Um, but anyways, I think it's good that, that the government in general is taking an active role in pursuing cyber criminals as well as pushing not only the the federal government but applying um, advice to civilian companies on their security posture yeah I, I, not a whole lot to add here again just it's been really positive that we've seen them aggressively go after ransomware gangs and try to shut them down um, or disrupt their funding mechanisms. I believe it was, oh, I, I'm blanking on the name of the pipeline, but a, a pipeline company was shut down, I believe, an oil pipeline company. Colonial. Thank you. And and actually, the Biden administration did help disrupt um, the payments and I believe recovered some of the ransom um, and, and did return it to Colonial. So there have been positive strides in that direction versus kind of shrugging our shoulders about it, but actually seeing it as a ongoing threat and, and trying to do more about it. So that's been good. And continuing on that, that government path, one of the friends of the podcast, um, and now I'm blanking on her name, uh, Christina Morello. 
Christina Murillo, right? We had her on about um, her book and she, she published a tweet and it was retweeting um, one of the reporters um, about TikTok and the U S house of representatives, chief administrative officer issued. Uh, and this was just recently um, probably a, a day or two ago, uh, a cyber advisory on TikTok where it labeled it high risk with personal info accessed from inside China. And at the end of this entire memo, they just had in bold letters, we do not recommend the download or use of this application due to security and privacy concerns. And this was an advisory for people who are using this on their personal devices. Now it's already been mandated. I'm pretty sure for government devices, at least the U S military for sure has banned TikTok from government devices, but it would not surprise me if, you know, all elected officials or, or whatnot have had that ban. Um, and a little bit of background, and it talks about this in the memo, TikTok is a Chinese-owned company. And in there, the advisory states that we believe the user base should be aware that this application is known to store users' data based on your SIM card, IP address, and GPS, your photos, and other PII in servers located inside China and potentially mined for commercial and private purposes. TikTok actively harvests content for identifiable, identifiable information like biometric identifiers and biometric information, including fingerprints and voice prints from users, uplo- uh, from videos that users upload to their platform. And additional data includes all content you create and upload, data you send within the messages, metadata from the uploads, cookies, file names on your devices, keystroke patterns and rhythms, and clipboard access which often can be used for password or used by password managers. And so, you know, this isn't anything that's a surprise to folks like us who are in cybersecurity, the dangers of social media, and especially uh, social media that is so prevalent like TikTok that is being, um, that is owned by a Chinese company. Um, I saw some of the comments, especially from folks who are not U.S. citizens about how, Companies like Facebook basically gather the same information. And like, I definitely understand that. Not that I necessarily, I wouldn't say I, I trust the U.S. government fully, but I probably trust it more than the Chinese government to, to do, you know, and that's my personal opinion, but understandably people who are not U.S. citizens may feel different about that. Um, but for at least U.S. citizens and U.S. companies, this is something to be very aware of, especially since we have a somewhat adversarial relationship with the U.S. Uh, with the Chinese government, I would say. So I thought that was interesting. Again, the U.S. government kind of taking a little bit more of a, um, just a more active interest in not only cyber defense, but, um, getting that information out there for uh, the user base. So um, when I saw this come up in kind of the rundown of things we were going to cover, it reminded me of a a bit of news that had come out a little bit before this, Um, not this U S house of representatives advisory, but uh, some reporting by Buzzfeed news that had come out and then kind of the response to it from uh, one of my favorite bloggers, John Gruber, who runs a very famous kind of Apple centric blog called Daring Fireball. And I just want to read his kind of response in the entirety. So we'll, we'll link to this Buzzfeed news article in the show notes, but this was talking about how TikTok has claimed whenever they get like a data privacy concern that in the United States, United States user information is stored in the United States, but the reporting came out through leaked audio recordings that, Um, Many U.S. employees, United States employees of TikTok uh, had had to turn over um, user data to uh, their Chinese colleagues, that Chinese um, part of TikTok had regular access to uh, United States user data. And so that's where kind of these concerns come from, is essentially that you should assume all of your user activity and data and everything that is mined by TikTok is accessible to people in China and, and by proxy than um, the Chinese government. But John Gruber had an interesting response to this, and I'm just going to read 
his quote verbatim because it's like two sentences. Now, it should be noted, as I'm about to read this before I proceed, that um, Mr. Gruber is is very out and open that he is uh, a registered Democrat. He is a, a very left wing um, leaning uh, ideology. And here's what he said. Like the proverbial stopped clock being right twice a day, the Trump administration was right on this one. TikTok should have been and still should be banned in the United States unless and until ByteDance sells the whole thing to a Western company. It's as bonkers today to let China run a popular media service as it would have been to allow the Soviet Union to run a United States TV network during the Cold War. I think that's an interesting take, and I wanted to get that on the record in the show just because I... I thought um, Mr. Gruber's take was really interesting there, but kind of a valid point, right? Like, it, I mean, I have TikTok installed on my phone and it is like crazy addicting because their algorithm is so good at surfacing videos similar to stuff you like um, and keeping you sucked in. But my goodness, do they harvest a lot of information and you should assume that is being used uh, maybe for not the most um, up and up purposes by um, governments that are known to be adversarial to the United States. And so that's, um, you know, another interesting take of maybe a good reason to remove TikTok from your device. I should add that for the most part, none of this is suggesting like TikTok, the app itself is like breaking the rules of like Android or iOS as a platform. Like it's not necessarily doing things like outside the app sandbox or, or, or malware, like on your device, but it's just that the service itself, um, captures so much information. And again, the flow of that information is not uh, transparent where it is, where it goes, how it's accessed by whom, how it's used. And, and that's really the concern here less so than like the app itself. Nobody is accusing the app itself of being malware or malicious. It's more the service, the cloud service, the back end, that where most of the concern comes in from. So, you know, it's a, uh, it's, going to continue to be an interesting thing to talk about because it is so popular because it is so addicting. Um, and it is so widely used in the United States that I think this will continue to come up and be talked about. And I can see why it creates, um, politicians wanting to get involved with it because of the kind of geopolitical side of it. Yeah. I mean, it, I don't have TikTok personally, um, but I'm also not one of the younger generation. I'm, I'm a little older than Adam and, um, plus I'm a, a little bit more tinfoil hat. Uh, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it is so prevalent among the younger generation. It is social media to like Gen Z and, uh, something like 10 million users or something like that, or, um, daily or, or something high crazy like that. So, um, I'm just curious, you know, if I was, I'm just trying to think if I was a cybersecurity architect at an internal company, would I block TikTok, TikTok from corporate devices? Um, and maybe not if you're just, you know, regular Joe company, but if you're doing business with the U S government, um, you know, that would be something that to take into consideration, um, for at least corporate devices, anything that's accessing corporate information. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just Absolutely. thinking out loud. Yeah, right? I think that's where you have to do a risk analysis. I would agree. Um, if you're like a defense industrial base contractor, as an example, um, probably shouldn't allow it there. Uh, just you know that, that that brings up a really good point. So I wouldn't I wouldn't advocate for a universal ban. Like you all should go out to your Microsoft Endpoint Manager instance and ban TikTok from all of your employee devices. Uh, I don't think that's appropriate, but certainly you should do analysis of um, your relationship and your uh, uh, your your individual risk to your organization. And, and I think in some scenarios it makes sense. Like I think it absolutely makes sense that the U.S. military has banned it from their devices. That 100% makes sense. Right. Yeah, I was at a conference that was local just last week, and it was something called Supercom, which is associated with an organization called InfraGuard. Um, they're a national organization which partners with the FBI um, to protect our nation's critical infrastructures, basically information sharing and partnership. And one of the uh, keynote speakers, um, both keynote speakers were actually phenomenal, but one of them was uh, the assistant director of the Office of the Private Sector, um, uh, AD Eric Velez. 
And he specifically talked about how China has a very robust private sector engagement. I mean, mainly because probably, I don't know exactly the ownership, but you can assume that if you're a Chinese private company, the government pretty much can tell you exactly what to do in China. And so they they basically have this uh, very robust private partnership where they're sending, you know, um, to the U.S. uh, people to go get jobs and then bring it back, or they send students here to get educated and then um, enroll and try to get information. And they use this private sector engagement as a weapon, and uh, FBI is trying to replicate that project um, to have better private sector engagement to essentially have better information sharing and and um, and uh, help gather information and and be better not only defensively but also offensively against um, China specifically so um, yeah I just think uh, this was all very relevant as far as like geo political threats as far as cybersecurity, cyber intelligence, threat intelligence. So um, very good to just kind of keep on the back of your mind, especially if you're one of those defense contractors. So our next story, Adam, you actually linked this in one of our shared chats that we kind of go back and forth on. And I was looking at it and it kind of reminded me of a different story. But why don't you talk about this one here uh, cause I, I thought it was fun. It was very recent. This is kind of a story that took on a life of its own and it grew as the week went on. So at first this started off as a fun story. Uh, Raymond Chen, who is a Microsoft employee had posted on a, a Microsoft blog telling a story that back in the windows XP days, uh, one of the PC OEMs that original equipment manufacturers that make PCs, you know, think of, Uh, a Dell or an HP or an IBM at the time. I think this is pre sale to Lenovo even um, discovered that when the music video for Janet Jackson's rhythm nation would be played, it could consistently blue screen their laptops. And they discovered that there was a resonant frequency in that song and and a resonant frequency. And I'm not going to get all the details, right but essentially is a specific sound at a specific frequency that can disrupt something else or break something else. So you think of like the proverbial like scream or sound that can shatter wine glasses. That's kind of the idea here. And so the resonant frequency in the song would cause a hard drive to like skip and essentially blue screen the whole device and would have to reboot. And the OEM fixed this at the time by making it so that their their laptops couldn't reproduce that frequency. So m- moving forward, as they would play, you know, the Rhythm Nation music video, it would not play back that frequency and therefore couldn't disrupt the hard drives. And that's where it started. And so that was a fun story. But then it took on a life of its own where, and this is the link I actually sent in the chat that Andy was talking about, MITER, the MITER Corporation, issued a CVE number for this, like declared it officially a vulnerability <laughs> um, and and uh, documented it in the whole bit. So again, for the most part, this is not really relevant today because again, like spinning hard drives are, are very rare in modern PC. So, I mean, that's no longer an issue because they're almost all solid state drives. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's also been, I guess at least that one OEM made it so their PCs don't play that that frequency anymore. So um, just a really interesting story. And I think that's kind of the, the, the backstory. Andy, what did you have to add on to what I just shared? Yeah. That concept of resonant frequency and using sound Mm -hmm. as an attack vector may have like originated back then. It wasn't like an intentional resonant frequency, right? It wasn't like Janet Jackson was like, let me see how I can crash hard drives. <laughs> well, and Rhythm um, Nation is much older than 2005. That song came out like in the early 90s or late 80s or something like that. So, I mean, that song had been around for already at the time, close to 15 years by the time this was discovered. Right. And so my uh, what kind of triggered in my head was um, there were a bunch of security researchers, Israelis, who actually discovered that they could use acoustics as a vector of attack 
Um, this was back in 2020 in like April, but they basically used vibrations from CPU, GPU, or PC chassis fans to broadcast stolen information like classified files or intellectual property through solid materials or like through the case of the PC to nearby um, smartphone receivers or recorders, uh, which essentially can break air gapped system protections. Like for files, they would inject malware to control the speed of the fans, which then can then be used to basically broadcast the information as it's getting transferred. Um, for encryption keys, they discovered that different RSA keys induce different sound patterns, and so that could be also stolen. It's pretty complicated, so it's not something that you probably have to be worried about. It was published in a paper Um, You have to be in close proximity. You have to have the right uh, decryption tools or software capturing tools in order to get all the acoustics. But the fact that there are people sitting around that think about how can I steal information? How can I break this system by using sound is just for me, it's like out of a sci-fi movie. Um, I just don't have that mindset. I just think it's fascinating that there are people in this world who are so good at figuring out exploits like this that they're able to not only dream of it, but actually implement it and test it and then succeed at it. Uh, it, That just blows my mind. So I just found this this Rhythm Nation uh, story triggered this one, and I went back and found the article for it, reread it, and um, yeah, it is possible to use acoustics as an actual cybersecurity vector of attack, but... It's pretty complicated. You probably don't have to worry about it unless you're like nation secrets, right? If you're Rhythm Nation, yes, it's a denial of service attack now. (laughs) But going back to your point, Andy, about the the creativity of these attack vectors, or or also I think you talked about, or maybe you didn't, it's in the notes, uh, using vibrations to potentially... Uh, break like air gap protections to communicate information through solid materials as well. And you're talking about the creativity of it. Watch me turn this into a plug yet again for diverse and inclusive teams, because the more we have folks from different backgrounds and different education levels and different experiences, they can help think of these creative attack vectors and how to defend against them. This is why our teams, our defensive teams, our blue hat teams need to be so diverse is because there's a lot of really smart, really creative people trying to break down the gates and we have to protect against them. So yet again, another great example why having a diverse security team is so helpful and so important to protect your organization. So I think it's another way to remind ourselves of that because this is just incredibly clever and novel and something I would never think about. Um, and I'm just going to go on a super crazy tangent for a second. If you ever want to go down kind of a fun dark hole of the internet, uh, and I've mentioned a couple of things you can kind of go research, you know, following up on the show. Another one that I found that is super interesting, kind of as somebody who grew up and and doesn't really remember a lot of the cold war were like number stations that were used for espionage and, and transmitting secrets to spies in the field. Um, these were literally like shortwave radio stations that most of the time played like garbage or like folk songs or whatever. But at a certain time of day, like a robotic voice would read off random sets of numbers. And those were coded messages to be received in the field by spies in the field with a little like shortwave radio. Um, and, and to, uh, uh, you know, communicate something to them or whatever. And they were all encrypted with like a one-time pad, um, as an example, but it's like this super creepy yet super interesting kind of thing that really happened in our world. Um, and there were all sorts of different number stations. There were Russian ones, you know, that played this song and then it would be all the numbers would be spoken in Russian. There were English ones that played like an English song and then did this. And it's a complete dark hole, but, um, I think it's called the Conant project or something like that. But if you just do a web search for number stations, you'll find it and there's recordings of them and it's, it's super interesting. Um, and so just a, a kind of, a 
talking about like creative ways of communicating information and, and getting like intellectual property or classified information out and disseminating it and, and kind of old school encryption, you know, just one time pad style encryption. It's all a method of that. So kind of on brand with everything we've talked about with geopolitics and, and everything else. Uh, another thing to check out if you're interested in kind of a history of several of the things we talked about kind of all mashed together. So another fun thing to look at. And that wraps us up. This was episode 101. We're quickly closing in on almost two years of this podcast. And, you know, I was afraid that we would run out of stuff to talk about. <laughs> yet here we are. No shortage of information for sure. Mm. Our contact information along with the show notes will be in uh, our contact information will be in the show notes as, as well as the links uh, for many of the things that we talked about this week um, if you have any questions or future topics you want us to talk about just reach out uh, with our emails or our twitter handles thanks and we'll talk to you guys next week thank you for listening to the blue security podcast please check out the show notes catch up on episodes you may have missed and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes find andy on twitter at ajaw zero and adam at aj brewer see you at our next episode